Uh, good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everybody. And um, today I'm going to talk about uh, um, resources um, and now the the uncertainty of estimating resources changes um, between teenage and old age, um, which is the later part in, in my view, is the reserve section. Um, I've got a disclaimer, like most people do. There's a couple of things that you'll see differently about my disclaimer. First of all, you can read it. Um, <laughs> And the second is, that as you scan through that, you'll see it, it basically says that uh, everything I say today has been drawn from public, uh, public information, that my opinions may differ from my valued clients, many of which are in the room, and they may also differ from many of my esteemed colleagues, some of which are in the room. I like to call it the lone wolf disclaimer, um, which means I can pretty much say what I like, um, and, uh, and hopefully um, it will be valuable for you to, to hear that. Um, the last thing is, of course, is that most disclaimers talk about, um, although we're going to tell you things, don't make any decisions based on what we, what we say. Um, um, we're an, an advising group, so we actually feel quite the opposite. I really do hope that you will take something back from what I say and, uh, and use it in your everyday investing life. Having said that, um, it will all be general in nature. Um, <laughs> So who are we? Risk is um, a global firm. We've got offices in London, um, Jakarta, Perth, and Brisbane. Um, we're, we're an independent business that uh, is filled with uh, geoscientists, reservoir engineers, and, and chemical engineers in general. We, we have access to a broader range, drilling engineers, um, commercial, et cetera, um, to support a wide range of services. Um, and we, we form teams based on what our, what our clients actually need um, uh, for any given engagement. The, what you'll see here is a, 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 some dots where we've done our work. You'll see that most of our work is involved um, uh, eastward of, the, of GMT uh, to Sydney. Um, we st tend to stay away from North America, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, there's large penetration in, in North America with, with very large um, and uh, historical service providers that do what we do. Um, and also, North America does things slightly differently to the rest of the world, um, in as much as much of their reserve and resource definition work um, and the way they uh, interpret the PRMS, which is the, something I'm going to talk about during the presentation, it is slightly different. It's driven from their, their um, SEC listing rules and also from uh, their predominantly onshore history um, in, in the industry. And so, the way that we interpret these things is more applicable to the, what I call the rest of the world. But having said that, you'll see there are some dots in North America. We do work um, there sometimes. So who are our clients? Um, I've changed this uh, a little bit, and this is like a, a non-standard slide for us. So this was a slide that you won't see anywhere else, um, simply because I wanted to expose a few things that are changing, um, or have changed in the last few years. Um, I mean, classically, we would support, um, in, in the middle of the bottom there, you'll see the term lenders, and that would have been a term that we would just generally use for anyone that was you know, you know, lending money to our clients and, and needed some kind of uh, independent assurance. Um, but over recent times, uh, things have, have changed, and so up on the top right-hand side, you'll see commodity traders. Um, you know, they've been entering the mix over the last few years of possibly lending money to, to um, clients to, uh, for future, future pricing, basically, future... Um, future future uh, contracts, and um, and also there's uh, family offices, um, which I know Rob spoke about yesterday from Argonaut. He spoke about uh, the introduction of you know, high net worths and things like that. Um, uh, family offices are, are real asset holders. So they're they're they're, lent, they're not really lenders, but they're, they're clients that hold assets, um, and they're. I would say a non-traditional um, client for us. You know, that's something that's just emerging over the more recent years. And also, we um, we service the courts um, through expert witness work. And on the left-hand side, you'll see some of our more usual ones, which is listed companies, etc., and utilities. Um, so a very wide range of client bases, which leads to a wide range of services, um, which we're coming now. Um, and most of these will be familiar to you. Today, I'm going to talk about reserves, which is the top middle here. But this gives you a very good. Um, context of all the other things that we do, um, and some of which you um, may be aware of, but some of which you may not. Um, acquisition, acquisitions and divestments is something that, um, that we, we do help with, um, and due diligence. Um, Pluto Train 2, for example, we advised uh, global infrastructure partners uh, for their entry to that. Um, and, and that's a common feature with, uh, throughout the year for us. And more recently, the energy transition, lower left. And I've got a slide on energy transition, and it's more like a, a barometer 
If you see what we've been doing with energy transition over the last 15 months, it's a really useful barometer to, to see, well, you know, what's, what are people doing? Um, and um, uh, we've touched on many of those things today and some things this afternoon, um, and some of them won't be talked about during the conference, but, but I think it's interesting to see how that energy transition concept is being interpreted by our, our client base. So first of all, um, reserves and resources. This is a, a familiar graphic to many of you. Um, it's called the, the PRMS um, Reserve and Resource um, Categorization Table. Uh, the PRMS stands for Petroleum Resource Management System. It's been formed by the SPE. And it's, a, it's kind of a standard um, in, throughout most of the world, not everywhere. Other countries, some, some countries have specific standards. But this is predominantly the one that's used around the world and it is the one that's really used here in Australia um, predominantly. Um, you'll see that uh, along the, the lower axis or from left to right, there's a range of uncertainty. So you know, an estimation of there's a number and it could be big or small. And as you go up the table, uh, that represents increasing maturity. So in blue, prospective resources or expiration. In gray, contingent resources or projects that have been discovered but um, have not proven their commerciality yet. And then in green, reserves, the, uh, the area that uh, everyone hopes to get to, which is uh, either you know, product, you know, projects that have been approved for development or are actually on development. And in fact, it's that last area, the reserve area, that I want to talk to you about today and give you some insights into what we've, you know, what we've basically observed. It's empirical information, I guess, what we've been observing over the last 30 years of um, working in this space. There are some other ways that people might look at this. Oh, one too many. The, um, <laughs> the bit where we, we like to have a little bit of a flutter and maybe there's some high risks involved. The part in the middle where everyone works really, really hard <laughs> to, to get to the next category. And then finally, um, the final part where we will celebrate because that's where Nirvana is. Um, the area that I said I'm going to work on here is I'm going to look at this, these areas here. Um, what I've just highlighted now is the, or on the right hand side is something called the subclassifications. Um, and what I should say, the, the PRMS is actually quite an elegant system. It allows for all of the volumes that all the technicians can possibly conceive of and place them in this grid and allow investors to understand um, what it is that they might be buying. And that could consist of just one category, or what, you know, just reserves, or it could have contingent resources or indeed exploration. But there are a few things that people don't appreciate that they need to really make a full understanding of, um, or get a full understanding of what actually is an offer. The first is that if, um, if somebody offers a, say, 3P volume, and they're not offering um, to tell you the 2P volume or the 1P volume, there's definitely an omission of information. And so one of the rules I've always got is if, if, a, if a higher category is being um, informed, then all the lower ones need to be informed as well. So a 2P without a 1P is not particularly good advice. A 2C without a 1C, not particularly good advice. Um, so that's the first thing, that um, if you've got a higher number, the lower numbers should also be shared for people to understand um, what kind of risk profile they're looking at. The next is these subclassifications, which I've labelled here. Um, so people can declare a reserve, and what you'll find out that these subclassifications are very, very different. And if they just say, I've got a 2P reserve, then that is almost meaningless um, because you don't know exactly where their project is classified. Um, and the last is that within the prospective resources, which is the exploration piece, there's always a chance of uh, a geolog geological chance of success or a chance of discovery, um, which is really important to understand if you're an investor. So a one in five chance is obviously very materially different to a one in 20 chance. Um, and, uh, and that's an important thing for investors to understand as well. And in the contingent category, there's something called a chance of development which isn't widely shared either, which is the chances that that volume will reach um, a reserve categorization. Now, the reason that's so important, someone could claim a 10 TCF contingent resource, and that sounds amazing. You look at the share price, and it looks really, really low, but what if their 10 TCF of um, contingent resource is uh, development not viable, for example, in that subclassification? Um, materially different to development pending. The, the contingent resource categorization is a very, very broad, very broad categorization scheme. What it signifies is that something's been discovered, 
but it doesn't necessarily signify its maturity unless you've got access to some of this. Contingent on a miracle. Could be. Could be all new technology. You know, there's, and I'm not taking anything away because these like, I mean, coal seam, no, sorry, not coal seam gas, but um, uh, shale gas and shale oil, my goodness. It, when I was at university, if people ever told me that things were going to be produced from nano permeabilities, I would have just told them that they were just making it up. So um, these categorizations are important, are relevant, and it, and it just talks about how things are in, in their current state. So um, I'm going to start moving a bit faster. Um, so justified for development. Um, the important thing that, to realize about this, this most immature area of reserves is that justified development actually does have contingencies. It's like a contingent resource in disguise. Um, it hasn't passed all of the commerciality criteria to become the next category, which is approved for development, in which case it's actually got a chance of slipping back into contingent resources. Now that chance may be quite small, it may be less than 5% or something like that, but it does have a chance of going backwards. Um, and in fact, we've seen projects that have done that, have been declared a reserve and have slipped back to contingent resources. This is an incredibly dangerous categorization as far as um, we're concerned, and something that we don't award very frequently. It's, we, we, um, we challenge clients significantly to, uh, for them to secure this. And when we do, we always make sure that um, the contingencies that they have are within their control. And they're not, there's no external contingencies, which, um, which is, is kind of key. So a lot of potential volatility for a justified for development reserve categorization. The next one, approved for development. Um, this is an interesting one. This is the classical undeveloped reserve. Um, probably got more wells to drill, so there's still the possibility of new information, but it's all been approved. The project will go ahead. There's every chance that there will be a single barrel or a single standard cubic foot of hydrocarbon produced, um, which is great. It overcomes one of those big hurdles. Um, and uh, uh, importantly, I think you know, a really good ex couple of good examples of this, of the volatility that can occur in this category is um, Waitsia. So when they went through their development drilling, they did have some surprises. Um, and also, more recently, Enterprise. Um, when that well went down, there were some surprises there. So it can still be quite a volatile category, but it does mean the project's going to go ahead. And then finally, on production, and people think this is the most stable area, um, where in, in actual fact, there can be changes that occur here as well. Um, and we only need to look at uh, something like Black Tip in the Northern Territories right now that um, it, you know, it's been on production for a number of years and is currently um, undergoing quite, uh, quite a, some quite serious problems with, with delivering the gas that uh, uh, they've been committed to. Okay, the short amount of time left. I'm going to go through this one, this one very quickly. Um, what I've got here is, is something, that a thought process I went through that, that's tried to envisage, well, how does uncertainty change as we ride, ride through those reserve boundaries? Um, the bit that I want to draw your attention to, because I've already spoken about the chance of justified for development and re-entering the contingent zone um, and, and its problems. But over here on the right-hand side, um, if you look at the blue line, that's my measure of uncertainty, and at the beginning, Justified development uncertainty is really high. As you produce and go through the approved development phase, it does fall. We do actually see it becoming quite sticky. Uncertainty you know, levels out at some level um, during production, and it's very difficult to get it, um, say, below a 40%, 30% variation from the, from the 2P position. Um, but in late life, we see those risks start to become asymmetric um, in as much as there becomes more downside than upside available to an asset. Um, and so that, that so uncertainty profile, as you progress through the reserve boundaries, um, isn't necessarily following the linear path that you may envisage um, at first. So as our assets uh, age, the common presumption is that reserve uncertainty reduces, and that's not necessarily the case. And I, don't, I do want to leave you with that with respect to reserve, but I did want to get to this last slide um, because I think it is quite interesting. This is something I put together just um, kind of highlighting where our business has gone over the last 15 months or so, and um, engagements we've had, <clears throat> which we put down to the broad structure of um, energy transition. And what you'll see here is you'll see clients uh, pivoting their existing skill sets. Uh, for example, um, helium or hydrogen, uh, natural hydrogen, um, geothermal. Um, these are pivoting, you know, drilling wells and understanding subsurface. 
um, people mitigating um, issues that are coming up through energy transition relating to, say, carbon capture and storage, emissions audits and things like that. Uh, and also people that are trying to push into um, new markets and do different things uh, like fertilizer, methanol, um, and, and, and maybe going into things that they previously hadn't considered. Um, again, so, so for us, energy transition, the interface of energy, energy transition isn't um, a simple thing. It's really quite complex, and um, our clients are solving this problem in many, many different ways.